Hello, I'm Katie Manning, and you're listening to The Sirens of Audio, you lucky people. <laughs> was that again? What, what was I listening to? I could have sworn I was listening to two different characters. Wasn't there two characters down? I think she played... She, I think she may have played more than one character, but it was the same actress playing more than one character. Dwayne, you idiot. G'day, audiophiles. This is the Sirens of Audio, the show that explores the universe of Doctor Who on audio. I'm Dwayne. And I'm Philip. G'day, Dwayne. G'day, audiophiles. G'day, Philip. How's everything going? It seems like ages since I've seen uh, since I've seen you. It has been a little while, but yeah, we just keep trading out the episodes anyway, so it doesn't matter whether we see each other or not, does it? Not really, but I was almost forgetting what you look like. Oh, I, I know. don't know how I could. I'm always uh, sitting in front of this screen editing you all the time so i'm so forgettable too so i understand that <laughs> today is uh, going to be very exciting because we're going to be speaking with the one and only sergeant benton john levine uh, he's going to be speaking with us uh from the uk so uh that's very exciting from one of my favorite eras sentimental eras the third doctor era was one that i really sort of connected with as a kid yeah i mean sergeant benton was just so gorgeous and teddy bear and puppish wasn't he like yes. he couldn't Help as um love him. He was just yeah. He was an interesting character to have, but he was always the sort of warm centre of that unit family, and always yeah, a bit bit goofy, but always lovable. And his contribution to Big Finish hasn't been that huge, so it's uh, nice to be able to talk to him about that. Whether he has any memories of it, because the Big Finish recordings are so fast, he may not remember too much. But certainly there was an impact with uh, a companion chronicle that he did, and he's done some unit. And some Third Doctor adventures as well uh, with Tim Trelaw. So it'd be interesting to get his thoughts on the recasting issue as well. But before we do that, Philip, do you know what? No, what, Dwayne? Oh, you do so. It's okay. time to... down the rabbit hole. Jump down the rabbit hole. Let's go. <laughs> right, Philip, now that we're in here, I thought just for a change, instead of throwing you a topic... Um, here's one I put together earlier because I did mention that I was going to talk to you about this. I thought instead of... What, two minutes ago? <laughs> it's given you more time to think about it. You've had more time to think about it than I normally give you. Um, but I wanted to just talk about that companion chronicle, Council of War, written by Simon Barnard and Paul Morris. I think that was their first... Oh, no, it was their second big Finnish contribution, wasn't it? After after a Benny. I think that so. they did. Yeah, so... Um, I just want to talk briefly about that because I listened to it today and I have no memory of hearing it before. So I think that was the first time I'd listened to it. And yes, once again, why don't I take the time to listen to more comp Companion Chronicles? <laughs> they the are best. fantastic. They're so good. I keep telling you this, Dwayne. Are you jealous of me having so much new content to explore? Oh, no. With my memory, I can go back to <laughs> Companion Chronicles and listen again. It's almost like listening the first time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, this was um, this was really good. Yeah, I really enjoyed this. Very interesting story of definite two halves. One was set on the actual uh, Kettering. Um, have you ever been to Kettering in the UK? Not that I know of. There is a Kettering here in Tasmania, so I always think of that when I hear. Well, and I, there's been a couple of TV shows based I on Kettering too. Don't think it was taking place in Kettering, Tasmania. No, I don't no. think so either. But the first half was set in the real Kettering. The second half was set on an alien world that was sort of adopting uh, the, the town of Kettering. Uh, what were your thoughts on this story, Philip? Did you have a re-listen uh, for our interview with John? Uh, I, I re-listened to it only a few months ago, so I didn't right. re-listen to this time. I was so excited when this was coming out because John Levine, and the, you know, I love the Companion Chronicles, and I loved what they were always doing new things. And by season seven, they were re being getting more and more inventive. And so hearing that they were bringing Sergeant Benton and John Levine was coming back to acting for the first time and coming to do this, because it's ten, almost 10 years ago to the day. Well, 
I was very excited. And the whole fact that he's playing a very suave, um, romantic character that doesn't quite get it right. He's still obviously Sergeant Benton, Benton, but he's in a role and his situation is not quite what he'd be comfortable with. I just thought it was well written and it was just a beautiful piece of piece. And that twist in terms of when suddenly they end up on a different planet, I just thought it was, was a great twist and that, yeah, the, the way they did the two halves and the, the way that um, John Levine and Sinead Kinan work together I thought bouncing with each other and the different characters they played, it was just a yeah, great story and a lot of fun. The writing of Simon Barnard and Paul Morris, I was interested at the obviously at the end of the extras, I wanted to hear what John had to say. And curious enough, there is no content with John Levine at the end. Do you know why that is? I have no idea, and I'm looking forward to asking him today mm. because there isn't much content of John around at all. So yeah. this this is quite a yeah, quite a rare thing we've managed to nab him. And part of it, part of it is a technology thing in terms of, um, I think we'll, you know, we'll explain, I might as well explain now. When I tried to organize him, he was quite keen to talk to us, but he doesn't own a computer. He doesn't own a smartphone. He only has a landline. And so actually trying to work out how to actually do this was actually a bit of a challenge. So I think lots of people, he just doesn't talk to many people because he's... And, and we haven't actually done the interview yet, so it still may not happen. Oh, so we, be positive, because <laughs> we won't be putting this out if it hasn't happened, so it doesn't matter. Of course it's happened, Dwayne. <laughs> there you go. You're in the wrong world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I was I was fascinated by, by the extras. And yeah, there's there's a certain... Uh, I, think, I think the authors, Simon, said he was dealing with mainly the first episode and Paul dealt with the second episode so and paul is kind of the the comedy guy of this duo they're both pretty funny i think but paul seems to be the one that injects lots of lots and lots of humor so there's lots of chuckling and laugh out loud moments throughout his writing what do you how do you like his writing well i can't tell who's who um i feel like i know paul morris's writing better but i don't know why i would think that i just yeah, cause he hasn't of, done much solo. He's only done a couple of things solo. Yes. Um, I th- I think the two of them are always very inventive. I think they always stretch limits slightly. And I think, as you've said, there's a lot of humour. A lot of, a lot of the humour is just in situation. And so you're not you're, you're never quite sure where it's going to next because they, they play on situation and, and that sort of content. But, yeah, I, I always love what they do and wish they'd be doing a bit more than they do do. Yeah. So it wasn't long after this that they – I think they were – at the time this was made, they were working on Jago and Lightfoot, weren't they? And also Paternoster Gang too. They did quite a few stories for the Paternoster Gang, so quite suited to that kind of Victorian to that kind of style. Uh, so this is slightly different, but you've still got because in Paternoster Gang too, especially, you've got a lot of comedy elements with Strax uh, get thrown in, and I think they like that that side of it. Uh, and of course, before they came to this, they were doing the Scarifiers as well, which was uh, a radio series that got taken up by have the you, BBC. I, have you ever listened to them? Because I've been meeting yeah. and I never have. Okay. Uh, I've only listened to one or two. Uh, they're quite good. I don't even know if I've listened to them right through. But very enjoyable stuff. Yeah. I, Great I like actors that. in there. Terry, Terry Malloy and Nick Courtney to start with, and then Nick Courtney uh, sort of swapped with... We well, didn't swap. They replaced Nick Courtney with uh, David Warner. So... Yeah, some good stuff in there. Uh, but yeah, to get to them, I haven't had time. I know, it's it's just, there's too much, too much stuff. But yeah, I really like this. I like the way that the Doctor sort of turns up right at the end to to save the day. And I think they wrote the third Doctor really well as as well. And, you know, John Levine doesn't put on, when he's, when he's uh, reading for the Brigadier and the Doctor, he doesn't go over the top, but you sort of can get a sense of the essence of their character in, in his voice, can't you? It's always interesting to when these, when these companion actors throw in their takes on their particular Doctor. So it's always interesting to get that. Yeah, it's a, it's a great production, really worth getting. Absolutely. That'll do us for our rabbit hole topic. We can highly recommend you get this one. So let's throw a trailer in right here for Council of War, starring John Levine, and we'll be back with the man himself in a moment. Coming soon from Big Finish Productions, Doctor Who, The Companion Chronicles, The Council of War. It was one of those quiet evenings that it all started. As I walked past the doctor's lab, he called me in. Sergeant Benson, have you seen any ghosts lately? I didn't pretend to understand science the way the doctor did, but I knew for a fact that he did not believe in ghosts. 
This is Captain Crow of the Blatarian Mining Corporation. You have previously been informed that we would be visiting your planet to begin the final harvest of human slave units. Trial? What trial? The trial of Marjorie Phipps. I think in the circumstances there is only one verdict that can realistically be reached. Marjorie Phipps, I find you guilty on all counts. The sentence is death. Hands up. Nobody move. I swung round into the doorway, covering the room with my pistol. Half a dozen giant cockroaches stared back at me. The doctor straightened up and raised his arms to adopt the Queensbury stance. On guard! <laughs> Subscribers get more at bigfinish.com. For those who've interviewed John Levine before, you will no doubt know what an interesting character he is. So uh, as soon as we did get in touch with John, he launched straight into uh, chatting with us um, and was very excited to talk to us, actually, and we're grateful for that. So we're just going to jump straight in to our chat with John Levine. Oh, hello, John. Hello, Dwayne. No, no, that's Philip, isn't it? <laughs> this is Philip. Hello, John. How are you going? I am very, very, I'm going very, very well. You've caught me on a very good day, uh, Philip. I'm glad we got you a good day. What, what made the day so good? Oh, well, I, I had major surgery uh, six weeks ago on my hip. And it's healed up beautifully. The surgeon saw it two days ago, and I'm, I'm back up on my feet. And any day above ground, as you well know, is a good day. <laughs> That's for sure. Was the hip replacement you had done? Uh, yes, it's a hip replacement. Yes, it's, I mean, it's a common thing now, but, you know, not so much when you have to do it, your bleeding self. You know, I mean, it's a lot of pain, a lot of this and a lot of that, but I, I'm just so grateful. Listen, I'm at the age now. I remember I was born and I grew up during the Second World War. I didn't see my father for three and a half years, and when he came home, I didn't know who the hell he was, and he just didn't want to know me. I had one of those dreadful, typical wartime baby childhoods. So uh, when you get to my age, to think that I've seen eight generations now, I've seen it all, almost all, war, disgrace, you know, and, I, and the, the, the world, let me just tell you now, I was, I've been very, very emotional lately because, you know, I, I had lost the woman I loved 10 years ago, and for some reason, I just can't get over it. Um, like so many people, you know, you stay in love with the person you thought you were in love with. It's called human nature. Um, but a lot of good things have happened. I've learned to sing. Um, I'm learning saxophone. Um, I, I, I've made life beautiful. And there's a couple of things I want to do, gentlemen. Obviously, I've done a lot of these interviews in my life. But there's something I want to read to you. Um, are you receiving me loud and clear? We are receiving you perfectly, John. But I do want to know, okay. what's, 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 yeah. what saxophone are you learning? Because I'm a tenor sax player myself. Oh, no, oh, um, listen, I'm only, I can only do little bits. I can do, just about do the solo in Buddy Holly's True Love Ways. I, I started too late, and then I had an accident, and I knocked a couple of teeth out, uh, which makes it just a little harder. So uh, it, it's a bit of a wild brag that I play saxophone, but I've got me on video playing it with my voice coach. Um, I'll tell him, music, music is the most powerful thing. Without it, I, I think I would have blown my brains out. Because remember, you're talking to John Woods now. This is the little boy from Salisbury and Wiltshire, born 1941. Dead, jaundice, and breach. In other words, to you men that know sod all about women, all we seem to do is damage women. And I'd love to be able to be God for one day. If you damage a woman or a child, I believe you should be put to death. Now, you might call, <laughs> you might call that a little strong, but we've gone soft. And all these pedophiles and all these bad bastards are getting away with it. And what did a computer do? It made it easier. So anyway, apart from that, I want to read you this. It's called, and I want you to share this with your viewers and say, if you want to know who you're really talking to, although it is really John Levine, but like I said, I'm really the little boy who grew up in a distressed childhood in a war-torn country. He can consider that because we're all children of our time. Our music, our love, our desire, our point in life is all to do with our time as we are children of our time. I'm an old man now. I'm not old because I've been a runner. I've kept active, uh, but it doesn't alter the fact that I'm old. So these are the words I'd like to share with you and just say to your listeners, 
this, if we could adopt some of this, now, you can't make people do anything, Dwayne and Philip. People are what they are. A leopard never changes its spots. That's pretty, pretty sure. Uh, my country's going through the most disgusting. I am a disgusted Englishman at the moment. Our politicians are a bloody joke. Our policemen are more bent than the bloody criminals. And women are being subjugated to all kinds of things. And no one seems to be able to stop it. Maybe that's why the Americans have guns and kill each other at 100 people a day. I don't know which is the best way out. But anyway... This is called The Paradox of Our Time, and this is how it goes, gentlemen. You might enjoy this. The paradox of our time in history is that we have taller buildings but shorter tempers, wider freeways but narrower viewpoints. We spend more but we have less. We buy more but we enjoy less. We have bigger houses and smaller families, more conveniences but less time. We have more degrees, but less sense, more knowledge, but less judgment, more experts, yet more problems, more medicine, but less wellness. We drink too much. We smoke too much. We spend too recklessly, and we laugh too little. We drive too fast. We get too angry. We stay up too late, and we get too tired. We get too tired to read, and we really sit down and watch TV too much. And we pray too seldom. We have multiplied our possessions, but reduced our values. We talk too much. We love too seldom. And we hate too often. We've learned how to make a living, but not a life. We've added years to life, but not life to our years. We've been all the way to the moon and back, and yet we have trouble crossing the street to meet a new neighbor. We have conquered outer space but not inner space. We've done larger things, but not better things. We've cleaned up the air, but gentlemen, we've polluted our souls. We've conquered the atom, but not our prejudice. We write more and we learn less. We plan more, but we accomplish less. We've learned to rush and not to wait. We build more computers to hold more information, to produce more copies than ever. But we communicate less and less, and less. These are the times of fast foods and slow digestion, big men and small characters, steep profits and shallow relationships. These are the days of two incomes, but more divorce, fancier houses, but broken homes. These are the days of quick trips, disposable diapers, throwaway mortality, one night stands overweight bodies, and pills that do everything from cheer you, to quiet you, to kill you. It is time when there is much in the showroom window and nothing in the stockroom behind it. A time when technology can bring this letter to you, and a time when you can choose either to share the insight within this letter, or just hit the delete button. If you press the delete button, maybe you have lost something that God sent you without you knowing it. But remember one thing, everybody young, old, ladies or men, Australia, New Zealand or England, anywhere. Spend more time with your loved ones because they are not going to be around forever. And remember to say, excuse me, I get, I get a little upset. I've just lost three precious friends and sometimes it's just too much to bear. You suddenly realize that this, this loneliness never actually goes away. So let me just finish this. And remember of all things, whatever you do in your day, Remember to say a kind word to someone who looks up to you in awe or even just respects you for what you are because that little person will soon grow up and they will leave your side. And remember to give a warm hug to the person next to you who may need it because that is the only treasure you can give and share and it doesn't cost you a cent. And remember if you can, if you have the guts, if you have the courage to look at the person you love and say, I love you, you've got to say it and you've got to mean it. Otherwise, all is lost and there is nothing to look forward to. So hold this moment in your heart and remember that someday these people that you love will not be there. So give time to love, give time to speak, and give time to share those precious thoughts that we trap in our minds, sometimes forever. This is John Levine on a February day in Salisbury, Wiltshire, talking to Dwayne and Philip in New Zealand and the other Tasmania, I believe. And I just want you to know that uh, motion, uh, we hold it back too much. We 
put it into the endless, endless pit of despair, which I call the cell phone. As you both know, uh, Kent would have told you, my beloved dear friend who I would die for uh, knows I'm not online and I don't have a cell phone. I just can't stand the cancer. Now, do remember my age. I'm almost 80. So I'm not going to be looking at all this new technology. It's a cancer and it's killing our children. But that's not my problem anymore. So anyway, look, thank you, first of all, for listening to that. There's one more tiny thing I want to do just while you're in the mood. Uh, You know, I became a singer. When I lost my wife, it was either blow my brains out or get something and get a life. So I left America, came back to England, and I was walking past a church one day about four and a half years ago. And I heard a choir sing, and now and again, a song comes along like the Beatles or Pink Floyd or whoever, you know, if you're modern day, whatever they are these days, there comes a song that just touches your heart and never, ever, ever, ever leaves you. Abba did it with a lot of their songs. Anyway, long story short, uh, I, I heard this, and I walked into the church, because when you're an actor, uh, you're given a sort of boldness. Um, Anthony Hopkins, who you may or may not have read, was my next-door neighbor for two years before he became Sir Anthony Hopkins. When he was just another actor, he moved in next to me and my wife and two children in a, in a, a road called Redgrave Road in Putney, which is where the English boat race starts every year, Putney Bridge. And uh, I was in Doctor Who at the time, uh, riding high. And one day at the bottom of my steps, this bloke who was a slightly Welsh accent came up and said, I saw you on TV last night. You were really wonderfully uh, absorbing. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, you, you're, you're just support. You know, you're fifth down the list. And yet every time we came on the screen, we seemed to want to watch you to see what your reaction would be to what the doctor was saying. And I suddenly realized, look, because I had no training as an actor, and like most of us, there's only three of us I know in England that became really famous at having been a walk-on, but we suffer the imposter syndrome. And that means is, the minute I got the job, I thought, well, how can I do it? I've not been trained. I've not been in the theater. I've not done voice. I'm just a young man who lived in Salisbury, grew up, his father hated him. What can I do? Anyway, look what I ended up doing. I ended up playing Sergeant Benton. And the reason I got it is my utter normality and my refusal to be vain or stupid. In other words, I was a typical, uh, uh, the kind of Englishman you want as a friend. Because I'll tell you one thing. The one thing we've got left is a good Englishman is the best friend you'll ever have. We are loyal and we are dependable to the nth degree. So anyway, long story short, um, I learned to sing. And when I got to Hollywood, one of the great musicians, a man named Dave Siebels, uh, um, uh, he's a, a, a huge, um, he's a, I can't think of the name, it's a B5 organ, and he, he's, he's worked with people like Stevie Wonder and so on. Now, I've just been sent, and I'm going to take your time, I'm going to say 30 seconds, and we're going to get back, so get ready to ask me any questions you have, but let me just play you this. This is, he just sent me this two days ago, this is a remix of a hymn, my favorite hymn. Let me give you 30 seconds of it, here we go. <laughs> My soul, my soul, how great thou art. This is original footage, gentlemen. No one else will get this. One more little bit. My soul. Okay, I'm going to stop it there. Save My Life, and that was one of the uh, 20 songs I recorded in Hollywood. Isn't that beautiful? It's called How Great Thou Art. Um, it's a great okay, team. Okay, gentlemen, thank you. Thank you for your patience. I'm now ready for, your, for you to talk. I only wanted to get it done because I had surgery six weeks ago. I tire quite quickly, so I've now given you my top energy. Now I've got all the rest to give you <laughs> at your request, so off you go. <laughs> we have many. T- I don't know where to start from, though. So feel free to just jump around as, as you will, because you know, your whole life is fascinating. Just in terms of b- before you started acting, you have done so many different jobs. Um, what was it that you actually enjoyed doing, and why did you start acting? Oh well, first of all, gentlemen, look. Back in my day, you usually just did one did one job. I was an auto electrician from the age of 16 to the age of 19. And then I went to Jersey, which is a small island off of England, between England and France, called uh, Jersey. And that's where I learned to dress smartly and found, found that I had a sense of humor. Uh, I've never been a womanizer. I've, never, I've not gone out with lots of ladies. I realize, looking back now, that I've only been married twice. I've only even been in love once. And uh, I've never been, I've always been far too embarrassed 
uh, to go the flirtatious route. I was just no good at it. It's, it's very simple. You know, men find it very hard to believe that we're not all made of the same stuff. And I often said to my close friends, I'm so glad I ended up a decent man. I'm so glad that I'm not on the dark web as some bloody weird bastard that does things that are English and eccentric. I've always been straight because I couldn't cope with anything else. There's nothing to be, I've been offered a lot of money for certain things all through my life, up to a million quid, but there was a catch to it. And that catch is going to catch you up and bite you in the ass one way or the other down the road. So all I'm saying is my fear of imprisonment, my fear of being un, I, I got out, the fear of being talked badly of uh, has helped rule my life because I, I just wanted to be a decent man. And that's why I ended up. And that's why I've ended up with so many fans, because really Benson is just me in a uniform. There's no acting going on there. In fact, when you see my website, I think Ken will have put it up on Facebook. I mean, uh, as you know, I don't have a computer or or smartphone, so I don't know any of her stuff. But we, I just put up a piece of edited stuff that I did with Richard a few years ago. One of the funniest I've ever been. I do. I'm a great stand-up. I mean, our, our scripts are pure Shakespeare, weren't they? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I love Shakespeare. I'll be honest, I get his books as soon as they come out. I think. <laughs> Yeah, Dexter, I, I don't know about you, a lovely hotel I've got here. I must thank Dexter. I, I, I mean, sliding doors, You're carpet... You're in a hotel? Wall. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> sliding doors, carpet water wall. I've never slept in a bloody lift before. <laughs> I, uh... <laughs> no, it's a... So <laughs> right. How long have you been doing stand <laughs> <laughs> Sitting down. <laughs> oh, you know I was meant to be in New Zealand and Australia this month um, with Armageddon. Yes, I think I had heard that you were hoping to come. Uh, but the thing is, as I said, my hip surgery, uh, I've had to cancel it. But it's all understood. We, we did it in time. But they've booked me for next year, just to let you know. So if, you, if, if I'm anywhere near you, let's make sure we meet up. Anyway, so then I came back from Jersey. I went to London. And I, by then, I'd gotten my confidence because I was a young man. I was a fearful, fearful, fearful young man. And I went up Regent Street, and I thought, right, I'm going to start at the bottom of Regent Street where Eros is, the thing in the middle of the Piccadilly Circus, and I'm going to go into each shop, and whatever shop it is, I'm going to say I'm the best salesman of whatever that shop sells. Well, the first shop I went in was Wedgwood China, which in England and maybe in Australia is the loveliest China you'll ever find anywhere, not because it's English, but, well, it is because it's English, but it's high class. And I, Anyway, I ended up going all the way up, and eventually about the eighth or ninth shop, was the number two menswear shop called Hope Brothers. Anyway, I ended up doing it about two and a half years, and that's where I met all the movie stars and all the, the, the famous actors, because Regent Street is where you all go. And then one day, one day, uh, a man I'd always admired as a, an actor, uh, Telly Savalas, who played Kojak, and uh, is in one of my favorite war movies of my generation called The, uh, the Dirty Dozen. And if you haven't seen it as young men, you want to make sure you watch it. It's just great movie making yeah it's, uh, great film. Yeah, it's called the dirty dozen fabulous movie anyway he came in they were making the dirty dozen out of l l um, l street studio and my manager who absolutely adored me because of my innocence remember people from the country in england you know we weren't very bright we weren't highly educated so i was just not not naive but i wasn't the brightest club in the bag you know anyway he said john look we've all done it before look this tell you why don't you go and serve them? And I said, yeah, but what about salesman number one and two? He said, oh, f them. He said, look, they've done it before. I said, I, I want you to see that, you know. Anyway, I went up and I said, good afternoon, sir. Can I help you? And I sold him three cashmere pullovers and a Burberry raincoat. Uh, anyway, we got talking and he said, uh, so you're, you, 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 you know, you're, and I said, yeah. And he said, you've got a great face. And I thought, why would you, you know, is, is he hitting on me? And I thought, well, he's not gay. So we're not like, Oh, bloody, I mentioned the word gay now. Um, so anyway, it, it, more or less, he just said that, you know, gosh, you should, you should have a go at acting. And it didn't even occur to me. The thought of being an actor at that time, I'd only just got a job in, as a salesman, and I was a bloody good one. And, of course, I wore my lovely suits. I love dressing. If you see most of me when you see me appear, I've always got the best shirt, the best tie on, which I've kept for 50 years, all since I was an actor. Anyway, so long story short, I ended up two days later when a famous comedian came in, and I made him laugh. Uh, by, you know, he said, I said, I had a lovely day. I said, in fact, yesterday I had the pleasure I had dinner with the Queen of England. And he was very impressed with that, you know. And, of course, what I really said to him is, well, he said he was the Queen of England. You know, you, you can't be too sure. And anyway, he said, right, God, you've got a good sense of humor. Well, within a week, his best friend owned a walk-on agency. 
And that's where you get 10 quid a day to walk on in the background. I joined it on the Monday. I was working by the Tuesday. I never stopped. I did over 50 different BBC and ITV shows. Then I got the movies. Then they thought I might have been James Bond. There's a couple of pictures of me that make me look very nice like James Bond. And then I got the job as the Cyberman. My agent phoned me and said, have you ever been a Cyberman? And I felt like saying, what do you bloody think? Have I ever been a Cyberman? What a silly question that really is. You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> oh my God, have you ever So anyway, uh, bless you, and then I got the Yeti. I got the big Yeti job, and that's when I met Fraser Hines uh, and Pat Trouton and Wendy Padbury. And the reason they all loved me, and I can use the word love because it doesn't matter anymore, I love me, is because... I didn't have any vanity. I wasn't big-headed. I wasn't stupid. I didn't drink. I didn't flirt with the women. They were, why am I married? I mean, there's men flirting. The reason it angers me is that, you know, you, if a woman's got a ring on her finger, the chances are she's bloody seeing someone. How dare you presume that just because she's wearing a skirt that you can hit on her? Uh, you obviously gathered this thing. I've got a hate for men that make women. I think one day it's going to turn around. Women are beginning to fight back. One of the great moments in England over the last year is the women winning that big football match. They're called the Lionesses. I yep. know it sounds strange. We've lost our power. England, we're nothing now. We're, we're very rich. I'm not. I can tell you now. I don't mind letting your viewers hear. I'm living on 7,000 English pounds a year pension. You know, uh, you know Doctor Who made no money. I'm very happy to disclose what I earned. I was on £90 an episode when I was in Doctor Who. That's what, 120 Australian dollars maybe? Yeah, not much more than this. £100 and, in other words, £400 a month. Salespeople in Tesco's and grocery stores get £500 a month now, minimums. All I'm saying is we never made any money. And when I became friends with George Takei uh, from Star Wars, Star Trek, uh, he and I used to run it. I was a long-distance runner for 20 years, uh, which is why most likely my hip ended up going. But he and I used to run together whenever we did conventions. I, I adored him. And you see, you know, that, that, that's uh, just for any of your viewers that are gay or have to, haven't come out yet and how hard the world is on all of us. Blimey, being straight now is difficult. Just just talking. I mean, this woke thing, and I still don't understand what the W-O-K-E thing means. Don't tell me now, otherwise it will make me vomit. But when you're talking about changing the James Bond movie, uh, the James Bond book, by taking out certain words, of course, there are certain words that are offensive, but all I'm saying is the world now has over-communicated. We are not doing anybody any good at all, and it is because of the innocence of Doctor Who and the fabulous fact that we are woven into your very being whatever it is about doctor who and to think i was in it for over you know from beginning to end about six and a half years and the thing i ended up from a walk-on to being one like, like the fifth lead and now i look back i was a good little actor i was never going to win an award but whenever i came on the screen you could not look at me well now i know that i wish i'd bloody known that but then i had john pertwee i had him in my left ear roger delgado in my right I had good people, you know, they helped me fly with angels' wings. And uh, often when you're in trouble, if you can hear the flapping, my father was on the Russian convoy during the war, uh, but he wishes he wasn't now with what this murdering bastard, Putin. Who rapes a five-year-old child and then blames it and then bayonets it to death? Who does that this day and age? Well, it appears Russians do. Isn't that extraordinary? And yet yeah. 70 years ago, my father risked his life, gone out of my home for four and a half years to take Russian tank, the tank tanks to Russia to beat the Germans. And now we're having, I mean, what a strange world it is. And you wonder why some of us use the F word. Anyway, so yes, yeah, so I ended up acting, as you know, but then I wanted to give acting up. Uh, coming along and, and, and certain actors were, I don't know, were so ego, I ended up not enjoying it and thinking, well, look, if I can't put up with this particular actor, all that particular, there were only two people I didn't like. Um, if I, and I thought, I, I don't want to do this. Imagine being on tour in a, in a theater group with some real bastard, of which there are many in all occupations. But there's something about acting, the, the fact that you think because you're on the road, you can get away with things. So I ended up thinking, do you know what? I don't want to do this anymore. I just don't want to. And I was getting wrong really well. I was being looked up at. You know, uh, you know, every, I was up for everything, all the movies, and John Pertwee and Katie Manning used to call me the Sunshine Superstar. I started to get everything. And then the Bond series started, and I went up for all the interviews, like everybody over six foot did, by the way. Uh, but the fact that one was put up means that one could have possibly done it. So, yeah, 
So that was it. Then I became a producer. I had my own company called Genesis Communications, a name my son, who lives on the North Island of New Zealand. Uh, I've now become a deep lover of that wonderful country, the independence of it. We love your lady prime minister, her, their lady prime minister. Uh, my politics are so disgusting and embarrassing. I would like to take Boris Johnson out into the center of our town square. I'd like to put my foot on his throat if I could get to his throat through the fat of eating so much foie gras. And I'd like to get a great big brush and comb his hair for once in his stupid life and thank him for dragging our country down into a laughing stock of Europe. And guess what, gentlemen, Philip and Dwayne, that's exactly what we've done now. And we're still down there with these little monkeys we've got now. This little, little, tiny, little pocket-sized little an Indian man. And I say that with, 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 with the same as I would say, Irishman, Scotsman, we Englishmen just use the name of it. And he stands there with his wife earning 79 million a year. And her parents worth over 800 million a year in India, telling me how to live my life. You see, gentlemen, it doesn't work. What does he know about living on $7,000 or pounds a year? And that's me. And I, I don't have mortgage or rent. I'm mean, sharing this with you. There's so much sadness and anger. I've never known my country so angry. It's like there's going to be a revolution. And everything's getting worse. Uh, it will get better. But I wonder, until we thin the herd, you see, uh, people, I've heard four people that I respect, Third World War. Let me just say this to all of you ladies and gentlemen listening to this. First of all, I won't say no to you thanking me for my honesty here. I could have come on this phone and just talked a load of bullshit about how great it was to be a fabulous character in one of the greatest TV shows ever to come out of the world, let alone England. And you can't deny that. Doctor Who, and with Russell T. Davis, let me just say this. After the tragedy and the bloody awfulness of the last lot, nothing to do with Jodie, Whitaker, by the way, she was fantastic. I loved her. But my God, oh, oh my God, what a dreadful doctor who dragged down into the pits of nothingness. Well, it's back and it's about time. I know a few people that work closely with Russell T. Davis. I don't ask any questions. I don't want to know. But I've heard stunning things. And this Mr. Russell T. Davis, he is the savior, not only of television, but the doctor who managed to get him back. It's going to be big. And I'm hoping to get a few more conventions out of it. We've had a dreadful four years. You know, the odd hundred dollars here, all that's gone. It's been, we've been living on just a bare pension. And I'm telling you now, I don't have a car. I don't drink, smoke, or eat meat. And I'm having, finding it tough. So you imagine uh, how other people are finding And I've always been a bit of a humanitarian uh, gentleman because I've seen people suffer in the third world. And I've never forgiven the white man for that. Um, if when you go to my website, go to the video section and look for a, a, the, the, my award-winning um, work. It's called Vibert Stokes. Vibert as in V-I-B-E-R-T. Vibert, that was the lady's name. And Stokes, S-T-O-K-E-S. It was called the Vibert Stokes Connection. And I, 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 it was against uh, 100 countries with 200 entries. And we won for best audio and best visual. And I ended up, so I ended up being an audio visual technician going all around the world doing it. And I absolutely loved it. One of my favorite jobs of all. And, um, as you know, just every other job in the world. I, I mean, God, I got, I was a, 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 a cruise director and assistant cruise director on the cruise liners for two years, which was just incredible. I saw the world. That's where I began to see the third world and what we've done to it, which is why I get so angry about it. But listen, there's nothing you can do. You know, the people with the money are always going to have the money, and the people without it are always going to be without it. It's only that we're allowed to complain now. It doesn't do you any good. All you do is you get hit and punished for it. But if you, don't, you, know, if you just don't stand up for something, then, then what's the point of, of your, you know, your daily... Anyway, any other Doctor Who questions, gentlemen? Um, you talked about the fact that you auditioned for James Bond. When you came to work for Big Finish, the, one of the, the first role you had was kind of you know, Sergeant Bender's James Bond in the Companion Chronicles' Council of War. I just want to, do, you have, yes, do, you have any, do you have any members of working with Big Finish? Oh, yes, I do. And, indeed, I have some good ones. Um, well, first of all, I love this, the Council of War. I mean, first of all, I'd never done voices before. And having been a close... See, John Petrie and I ended up very close friends for a very simple reason. John was what you call, in our business, a nice user. In other words, because he had such a busy life, 
wherever, whenever he went on tour, if he could find someone to help drive his car and, you know, help, uh, help him put his clothes on, I don't know his clothes on, but his costume on before we went on stage, or whatever. And he chose me from the moment we met when he, we were, we, we used to rehearse in what they call TA halls, TA meaning territorial army. And they were just little halls. Uh, we used to rehearse there. And when Pat Troughton left, uh, Barry Letts, the producer, the new producer, came up and said, gentlemen, and, uh, to me, Nick Courtney, to myself, and to uh, my, well, I think to Pat and, and Fraser, we've got the new doctor, and of course, in walked John Pertwee. And from the moment I saw this six foot four, incredible man, I knew that I was going to have a friend for life. And indeed, uh, I saw his wife um, uh, just about three, four years ago, and she said, by the way, I want you to know that just before he died, John asked me, his wife, to thank me for my friendship, my loyalty, and my integrity. And that was one of my great moments in life, to think that John Pertree, this man who was one of the royal family's favorite performers, uh, thought that highly of me. And that's why this little boy from Salisbury, John Woods, my real name, uh, ended up being a modest John Levine in Doctor Who because I'd seen all the working class traits and all that. So, yeah, uh, life has been interesting. And then, of course, I went to Hollywood and I ended up uh, becoming friends with Robert Wagner. And the interesting thing about that is that his wife, Natalie Wood, who used to be one of my favorite actors, um, back when my daughter was born, uh, my real name is Woods, as I said, and we, I wanted to call her Natalie, which would have made her Natalie Woods. Um, uh, but we ended up with Samantha. But anyway, when I met Robert, I, I moved to Hollywood in about 2000, uh, 1989, uh, 1990. I, I can't think of that year. But what happened is that I was, um, uh, I, I was working uh, somewhere. I can't remember where because I've done so much in my life. You know, your brain does go numb. But anyway, I was, uh, oh, I know what it is. I just had some very bad news, and I was uh, having a little tear. And I was sitting on a bench uh, on Hollywood Boulevard because, you know, the, 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 that was the main street. I lived in Burbank, and uh, you know, I, I used to get the bus. Not that they're very frequent there. There's only like one every hour. Anyway, this woman saw me crying, and she said, oh, I said, I've just lost someone. And she said, well, look, instead of crying and feeling sorry for yourself, why don't you take that lovely voice of yours and phone a friend of mine? Uh, they have um, a raped and battered woman um, home where they protect women. And in America, for some reason, they abuse women at a high rate of knots. Uh, to the point where you have to consider they're at war. So with their abortion rate and their abusing women rate, as you know, when one of their football teams lose, 100,000 women get a fist in the mouth. They're the people I want put to death. They're the bullies, these great big stupid men with brains that don't do anything but hurt people. Why are they walking around, wasting, and then you get a little baby that dies at the age of two months because they couldn't get a blood transfusion. And you think then, is there a God? Is there not a God? But that's way beyond all of us. I mean, that's, that's again, that's something, you know, I, I work on a basic assumption, but to thine own self be true. And uh, that's what I've always done. So, yes, a big finish came along, and I couldn't believe how fabulous... Uh, that Council of War was, um, not having done voices and knowing John Pertwee did a hundred of them. And he always told me it's the way you hold your jaw. In other words, if I like to hold my jaw down like this now, you can hear my voice kind of it changes into a slightly posher English, right? But, but like, if I put my jaw up and put my, put my lips together like that, I sound, I sound a bit like an East Ender, don't I? You know, somebody wants you on the dog and bone. You know, the dog and bone means phone and apples and stairs means pan, um, apples and stairs. Um, I can't, I've lost myself in my own language now. Anyway, yeah, so it came along, and I think I just noticed, I'm not sure, but there's a huge TV detective show launching again on TV tonight. It's called Unforgotten, and there's an Indian gentleman who's very popular in England, and I think, I've got a feeling that, that this lady, Sinead Keenan, may be the leading lady. I may be wrong, because I missed the little bit, the little clip, but that was the beginning, and I absolutely, and I'd never done voices. And as you know, I did the I did the monster and everything. Three of them, two of them, you wouldn't know was me. And in the rest, I didn't try it because I don't do impersonations. So when I did the Brigadier uh, or John Pertwee, uh, I just spoke with a slightly different voice because I don't do impersonations. But yes, it was wonderful. Um, I seem to be in their bad books at the moment. I've not heard from them for nearly two years. Um, I don't know whether it, I don't know whether one because you know one 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 is not allowed to really give an opinion about anything except I must say I love I tell you what I love about Big Finish their production. Value. Um, I hear da David. Uh, uh, what's his name? David Richardson. Not Harrison, um, Dave Richardson. He's left. He, yeah, David Richardson. I understand. He, I've only just heard, but he's left. I understand. He's working just part time for them now on a freelance basis. Oh, okay, part time. 
Oh, okay, bless him, okay. Well, as I said, so I haven't heard from them uh, for a long time, but I also enjoyed doing the third Doctor Adventures, uh, which was rather nice. I mean, starring, uh, you know, opposite, the, well, of course, Tim Trelaw uh, does John and Katie Money. Katie's always, Katie and I, look, we've been friends all of that time, look, all of that time. Oh, I know what I wanted to just um, uh, say to you. I don't suppose you've read my book. I mean, let's be honest. I, I'll be honest with you. When we started it, I thought when you wrote a book, as I said, I've lived on so little money, and it has been difficult, but like I said, I'm not going to get into debt uh, just for anything silly, but I thought I was going to make at least like 5,000 quid out of my book, you know, worldwide. I, I ended up making less than 1,000 quid in two years, so what I'm saying is all the work, three years of grind, but in my book, um, I don't know, ha have you seen it? Did you know I've got a book out? I did know you have, tell us, about, tell us a bit about your book, and we'll give it a plug. Well, okay, very briefly, it's my autobiography, and it's called Run the Shadows, Walk the Sun. And that title came from when my wife and I, she left me uh, 10 years ago now, uh, when I was in Hollywood, which is why I'm back in England. But we used to run the mountains every weekend. We got addicted to it, because I was a runner, as I said, for 20 years. And we used to climb up and then run down the fire trail in California. And we loved it. We asked, oh, my God, it was almost better than sex. I know that sounds a bit silly, but if any of you out there are listening to this and you have never tried giving it a little jog, now, you don't have to do a mile in a minute. Just put on a pair of trainers and always buy the best because it's the end of the day. It's the most important thing. Give a little jog or just a fast walk a try. It changes your life and you hardly have to do anything. You already walk. Why don't you just pop to the park or down your street? Do it in the evening when there's nobody about. Uh, of course, not dark evening, otherwise you'll be clubbed to death for your money. But anyway, um, the gentleman, every word in my book is to do with me. Uh, uh, but I had a ghostwriter who obviously helps you um, <clears throat> place and, 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 and for punctuation of things. And this is, what, um, this is why I chose it. His name is Michael Seeley, and he'd written the biography of Douglas Canfield, who was the director that gave me my break. Behind my back, Barry Letts, the producer, and Douglas Canfield had watched me as a walk-on, I had noticed I was first there and last to leave, and one day they asked me why. I said, well, I come on 10 good a day. I can't wait to get to the studio to see the sound guys set up, to see the cameramen do their focus and their white, you know, their white card, to watch the sets going up. I used to love it because I had such a lousy childhood, a bit like Michael Jackson in that way. You know, I just wanted to see things grow and, and be nice. <clears throat> anyway, so anyway, that's how I ended up getting the part. And then Michael Seeley sent me Douglas's autobiography, and it was so beautifully written when I decided to do mine, um, uh, I, 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 this is what, and this is what he said, this is what's on the inside of a cover. And of all the things I've read about anyone else, including myself, this is one of those beautiful descriptions uh, of a book. And, and so th these are the words, just, just listen to this. He, oh, no, you know I've had a few names in my, you know, John Anthony was my real name, John Levine. I was also John Anthony Blake, a radio presenter in England for two years. I was also Johnny Red Boots Bingo on the cruise line. And so I've had all these names. So he starts off. He has had a few names during his many lives, but the one for which he is best known is John Levine, the self-taught actor who brought to life the much-loved Benton in Doctor Who. Yet his journey to our TV screens was hard, and frequently painful, and what came afterwards was just as traumatic. This is the emotional and truthful account of a life that should not have been lived. We follow the pure highs and the brutal lows of a working-class Salisbury lad and his struggle to get away from his origins and his ill, under-educated, and misunderstood boyhood. With no genuine prospects in a world in which he did not fit, his journey takes him to places like London's West End as a private detective, to Paris and Spain and Africa, where he organized spectacular events, and then crossing the globe to South America to witness the enormous gulf between rich and poor before moving to Hollywood and daring to dream of success. Run the shadows, walk the sun, demonstrates your life is not automatically set for you when you are born. There are opportunities to be grabbed, but only if you have the courage to take them. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah, well written. My book would tear your heart out. It's a beautiful piece. And just to let you know, my last chapter, the last chapter is called The Forgiveness of Two Fathers. My father died. He was bomb disposal man at the end on Salisbury Plain. I've heard 
sure you've heard about the secret air base on Salisbury Plain, yep. where all the UFOs come from as well. And he was burned to death in 1972. And um, and uh, anyway, that's I, anyway, yeah. So and I never I never got on with him because he hated me and so on and so on. So in the end, I ended up hating my son. When he was born, he ended up being a thieving little bastard, and nobody liked him, even my own mother, you know, kind of, oh, my God, what a trouble, man. And he ended up really dragging the family down into the dirt, but then suddenly he ended up changing, married a New Zealand lady, he's now flourishing in the North Island of New Zealand, and why has two children, my grandchildren. But anyway, the last chapter is called The Forgiveness of Two Fathers, and it's interesting how, having seen how Jason became such a beautiful father to his children, and then the thing how bad I was to him, although at the end I was a good man. Um, but all I'm saying is, yeah, the, the final chapter is actually, I, I, as I said, the sales, I, I, I don't know, I, I, it's hardly worth doing, but make sure you get it. Not, I mean, it's, not, it's $20, but you'll find it's a stunning read because I, I bear my soul in it, and you'll see, you, you've no idea what it took. Uh, for me, uh, uh, you know, to do this. And by the way, the, the Run the Shadow Talk the Sun is when my wife and I, bless her lovely heart, um, I think she's still, I don't know whether she's married or not, I don't really want to know, uh, but we used to climb the mountains. And when we came down late, what would happen is, uh, uh, I don't know whether you know, but if you go up a mountain, uh, whether it's summer or winter, when the sun goes down, those mountains get real cold, real quick. And sometimes we leave it a bit late. Now, remember, all you ever had on was shorts, a T-shirt. I mean, nothing, you know, because you were in California. Anyway, one day it got so bloody cold as we, because we were going down around the mountain. Every time we left where the sun was shining, uh, it, we went into the shadow. And I thought, bloody hell, we're going to freeze to death. And I remember turning around to my, my wife and saying, Jenny, what we need to do is run the shadows, walk the sun. So get through the shadows quickly. Yeah. So when we got to the sun walk to get the warmth and I thought what a great name for a book so that's that's what it's called and uh, it's a lovely piece of work and the cover I designed myself because I remember I was in designing I did audio visuals for 15 years uh, and loved it so now I'm basically retired but what I'm working on at the moment I don't mind sharing this with you um, <clears throat> Salisbury I, I'm sure you've never seen Salisbury it's, it's become one of the most popular places in the whole of England to live because we're only five miles from Stonehenge <clears throat> and Old Serum so we live in a very special place so anyway, very briefly, uh, it was going to be this year, uh, but I had to put it off next year. I, I, we have a big marketplace, which has just been relayered with a guild hall and trees all around it. And sometimes they have a major bicycle race and there's tents around all the perimeter of the, with all the different bicycles in there and with all their engineers. What I'm going to do is I'm going to executive produce. We're going to be calling it the Dalek Invasion of Salisbury. I, all through my years as an actor, even when I was a big, very famous, I always gave a, more time uh, to the gentlemen that were inside the Daleks and all the monsters and all the extras and all the people that worked to put all the effort in. And that's one of the things John Pertry liked about me because I always looked to the smaller man because that's how I saw myself. Anyway, that ended up with me getting a lot of friendships and a lot of loyalty. So I, I think I'm going to be able to get some upwards of 80 Daleks and I'm going to call it the Dalek Invasion of Salisbury. We're going to have spotlights. We've got all the military. I'm going to get the military involved with jeeps and tanks and smoke machines. We're going to prime the audience to let them know that we're going to ask the Daleks to attack them so that anyone who wants to do a little bit of play acting, we're going to have searchlights, smoke bombs, Go, GoPro cameras on Daleks and on the, on the audience. And then in the middle of it, uh, we're going to announce it with me doing a voiceover with remember, searchlights, jeeps, the whole thing. It's going to be fantastic. I think it'll be the biggest thing in the world. Now, having said that, um, I've got a politician um, who uh, wants to join me uh, because we want to raise the idea and, and the creative mentality of our school children. As you say, these computers are dumbing them down, and she, we're joining forces next week to hopefully, and I'm going to be going to lecture at all the schools using uh, my Doctor Who power, because that's what it is. Uh, I take it very seriously, as you've obviously gathered. I don't take Doctor Who lightly at all. And that's why this, and the new actor, by the way, a gentleman of color, I understand he's absolutely sensational as a performer, and I think it's actually a good thing. Um, Russell T. Davis doesn't make any mistakes. When he casts someone, you know he's got it right, and I'm telling you, I, like I said, I don't know, I've, not, I've, I've heard that he's stunning. I do have what I call an, a friend on the inside, and as I said, I never ask him anything because sometimes when you have knowledge, uh, you know, you might want to let it, you might let it spill out. So I don't ask anything because, because he's a fan of mine, but also works 
within the, the, the upper echelons of Doctor Who. The, the reason he likes me is because I don't ask him, so who was, you know, were you with Catherine today or was it David Tennant today or whatever? Uh, and and that's, why, uh, that's why I call royalty. Uh, you know, there are times to ask questions and times when, when you don't. Um, but anyway, yeah, so all in all, uh, I've ended up here. I, 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 I'm in this lovely little house. We call it a two up and two down. Uh, but of course, I was meant to be with my son in New Zealand. Um, as I said, I would have landed about five days ago, but I've got it to, to do next year. Um, oh God, it's, it's just, just, just incredible. So, all right, you need to ask me a few more questions, gentlemen. John, I was curious to know uh, when you're working with Tim Trelaw, what was that like for you working with someone that sounds so much like John Pertwee? Was that sort of bringing back the ghost of John for you? Well, I mean, it, it, I've always thought it's very clever. One of the things I'd love to have been, apart from being an actor, was an impersonator. You know, we, we hold impersonators in very high esteem, like John Colshaw. Funny enough, he was thrilled to meet me. He said, oh, my God, he's one of the biggest names in England at the moment. And he, he, his tongue hung out when he met me when we did our first recording together. Yeah, Tim, um, um, you know, anyone that can produce a voice like that, it always fascinates me. That's all I've got to say, other than that, how lucky they are and how, what a lucky bloke he is. I hope he's grateful for that, uh, of being able to say John Pertwee's voice. I just want to ask you quickly about, in terms of um, Katie Manning. Um, you say you're still good friends with her. How, how often do you get to see her? Well, we phone each other semi-regularly uh, because, we're, you know, we're both very busy. Of course, she's doing all the voiceovers and all the documentaries. Now, you know the Blu-ray 9 is coming out this next month. Uh, yep. I'm only in one story in this particular one. I'm in The, my, the, the Time Monster, and we did a little documentary. Uh, one of the people I'd love to rave about is Toby Haydock. Uh, he's, the, he's a gentleman that what we call the Doctor Who mine of information. He's the one that does the interviewing on all the little DVD links yep. for, the, for the Blu-ray series. And I've got, he's one of the few people in the world that I absolutely admire, look up to, and worship in terms of talent. So anything I get to do with him ends up being lovely. And we, I did a lovely gag with him on the, in the Time Monster. I won't tell you what it is, but it's to do with the force field. So when you get the package, if you do watch the ninth, uh, you know, the, the Blu-ray ninth series, you'll see the documentary uh, where we go back to where we filmed it back in 19, I don't know, 81, whatever. Um, and we do a lovely gag with, with, about the force field. And I want you to know that it was my idea. And I gave Toby uh, the part to get the big laugh uh, because I just wanted to pay him back for being so good to me over the years because a good interviewer is, is everything. I thought you both might have been wearing nappies during the interview because it was Time Monster related. Oh, oh bless you. No, and you know, don't you, that that was my... I, I dread seeing that scene. I, it, when you look at that, that wasn't acting looking embarrassed. What had happened is, the rumour goes, John had uh, slightly bent the, the nappy pin, which was holding the nappy on. It was one of those great big things that Scotsmen used to hold their kilts on. I mean, a really big uh, pin. Um, anyway, the, the idea was that it might have fallen off when I stood up which is why John and Katie are laughing so much. It didn't fall off, but it did slip down my hip a bit, uh, and, and it was very embarrassing, which goes to prove I'm not what they call a real, real actor. A real actor should be able to do that. With a, I, I almost crumbled under the embarrassment of it because I don't have the kind of body. If you look at my body, I've got no pecs, no arms, no, you know, I'm not like a, a fit bloke. So I've always, I always felt a bit embarrassed about that. The Demons was my favorite, no question. That's when I felt like a star. If for all of you people that are listening, lady, man, young or old, now and again you know you're doing a good job when everyone around you gives you a bit of praise. And by then I'd gotten hold of the idea of the character of Benton. And I remember thinking, gosh, uh, how lovely. And then, of course, the demons came along. And because we had all the time on rotation, because the studios were on strike, uh, we ended up being uh, having all that what they call uh, video footage or film footage, which made it a superior performance. Now, I'm sure you know that Russell T. Davis, the company he owns, sort of Bad Wolf or Black Wolf, whatever it is, I believe that he's being backed uh, by Sony, uh, which will mean a huge amount of finance. I've got a feeling that Dr. It's only my opinion, I could be wrong. But I've got a feeling Doctor Who now is going to be elevated up there with Star Trek and Star Wars. In other words, he's back. The man is a genius. The stories he writes are beyond fantastic. We're in for a wonderful ride. I would give anything to be in one episode. I would have been a brigadier by now, but evidently they're never going to have us back, so I've given up that thought. But by God, wouldn't I love to be just in one episode to say hello, you know. Why did you say they're okay, never going to have, else, why, why did you say they're never going to have you back? They're starting to have them back all the time. 
Oh yeah, but I mean, I, I, they have lady companions, but they don't. You know, they they they, they have they've not had any male companions up to date. To date. And also, unit, you see, in our day, stood for United Nations Intelligence Council. It doesn't stand for that now. They changed the uniform and changed the uh, the, the, the the letters, and that's why I believe uh, they're never going to have us back because we are old and they just want new. I understand that. Uh, we can move on from that. <laughs> so are you hoping that there might be some more big finish work in the future well yes you always hope but like I said um, I, I, I don't know whether they have a blacklist <laughs> or not I, I hear that they can get a little irascible sometimes and I, as I said I, I never, I, you never know I don't bank on anything gentlemen I've, I've been in the business a long time uh, we've, we've, this has been a long fulfilling call hasn't it Philip and Dwayne it has been amazing been John, fantastic. Thank so you, John. thankful you you you've never done one like this, have you? In, uh, in uh, no, and can I just say I love the fact that you don't pull punches at all. Well, look, gentlemen, I think we're going to wind that up now because I'm exhausted. So, yeah, like no. I said, thank, thank you, you so Sean, much, John. You tell your list, it's been, it, hang on, I'll let, I'll let you finish. I'll say goodbye, and I'll let you just say goodbye. Thank you, John. It's been uh, been a blast. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, really enjoyed talking to Definitely. you, and I'm, I'm looking forward to catching up with you in Australia. I'll take you out for a meal. Okay, I'll tell you what. Now, wouldn't now? I'll tell you what. I will hold you with that. I will hold you to that. <laughs> it's a promise, John. All right, my darling. As I said, it's been a very, very pleasure talking to you. And I, not many people open up like this, but I've got nothing to lose now, Dwayne and Philip. You know, no. as, as we say in England, come on. <laughs> Thanks, John. Thank you, John. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. From Big Finish Productions, the Third Doctor Adventures. Volume 5. Some sort of interference. Completely blew the TARDIS communication circuits. Twice. <laughs> Great heavens. Hello, Doctor. Doctor, are you in there? Doctor! Doctor! I do wish you'd pay just a little attention, Doctor. Well, I could say the same about you. Uh, Doctor! Liz! Professor Liz Shaw! Good to see you again. You too. Fucking here! Here you all! Ah! Yeah, uh, sorry about that. Open fire! Alright, this is Brigadier Lethbridge Stewart. I have resumed command. Abort this launch. I repeat, abort this launch. Commander, planet Earth within broadcast attack range. Do it! Sorry, Private. I think I closed the door a little too quickly then. He probably think I'm off my head. Surprise what I'll believe, Concrete. You called them Primords. From Primordial, I presume. So you saw the Primords? That's what we're calling them. Primords. Stop it! You useless thing! Just stop it! I think we might need to broaden our definitions of what's possible. To think of all the money wasted feeding and clothing these monsters every week. I know what I heard. I wish I could say the same. Like someone or something has stolen the entire street. It said, help me. They're coming. They're going to kill us. Blimey. Fire at will! They keep saying it's for the greater good. For the good of the country, even. The but country? <laughs> There go my speakers. Big finish. We love stories. Well, Philip, um, I'm not quite sure how to follow that. That oh, was can... one of the most fascinating chats I think we've ever had. Yeah, far, far reaching. <laughs> I'm looking forward to hearing how you edit that. Uh, and I suspect our listeners out there aren't going to get anywhere near the um, full value of what we just got for the last hour and a half. <laughs> yeah. Really, really interesting interesting stuff what an amazing life i mean unbelievable life he's lived and the people he's met and had contact with and the way he's respected i mean that is astounding yeah um, but he certainly has a lot of strong views which he holds strongly and doesn't hold well he doesn't hold them he lets them go out yes. into the world so as he says uh, he's got nothing to lose and you may have the opportunity in the next year to talk to him yourself if you're in Australia, New Zealand, because, uh, yeah, he was supposed to be here for the Armageddon um, shows, but uh, had to put those off. So he'll be back next year, 2024, if all mm. goes well. And for our UK listeners, he's often in conventions over there. So 
Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And something to look forward to on the Season 9 box set that's going to be out very shortly. Yes. All right. That just leaves us for this episode with uh, a recommendation. Have you got something, Philip, that you've been listening to that you would like to recommend? You want me to go first, do you? Well, let me just check. Yeah, could you? Could you go okay, first? I will. Um, so, as you know, we've been listening to Schilling and Sixpence. Well, I've been listening to Schilling and Sixpence. And actually, um, I drove to and from Melbourne last weekend, taking my son back to uni. He's studying Oh, you drove? Ex. I drove. That's why I didn't. That's why you, there was radio silence. Yes. In the car. I was in the car. So, <laughs> it's a 10 hour drive one way, really. That's, that's basically non stop. So we listened to Schling Sixpence season one on the way down. We started season two and I listened to the rest of season two on the way up and finished it about halfway back to Sydney. And so I thought, well, what do I listen to? And in the extras, Nigel Fair is talking about the fact that a lot of these came from the Pogney Wood Murders, which is this uh, series of podcasts that Nigel's done, which are much sillier and much funnier, like really funny. And the names of the characters are hilarious. Um, like Chris Anthem and <laughs> uh, what are the, just the most hilarious names. Rose Thorne. Uh, is there? I think there might be. I'm not sure. Don't know. I just made that? it up. Yes. I think Chris Anthem. Nigel, funny you out. can't take that one if you haven't used it yet. <laughs> so, yeah. So, there's a podcast which they did during lockdown um, called The Pogley Wood Murders. I've only listened to the first four episodes so far. Um, but, yeah, they're sort of... I mean, the death rate is hilarious, but they're really good whodunits as well. And there's sort of clues along the way and the you know, reveal at the end of each second chapter is very funny. And there's actually a Detective Sixpence. So Nigel Fares plays Detective Sixpence, which is sort of where the name, I suspect, comes from. I don't know. I know they're based on his live shows as well. But if you're in for just some very funny, very funny murder mysteries, Nigel Fares, The Pogney Wood Murders. Very good. What are you listening to, Dwayne? At the moment, I haven't finished the first story yet, but I've been getting into the First Doctor Adventures, The Demon Song. And the thing that still grabs me every time I turn this on is when I look at my phone and I see the beautiful artwork for that. It is one of the best covers. I I think it's my favourite cover that for a long time. I can't it's think a great, of a better. It's a great cover. It's just wonderful. It just it really connects you with uh, with the story beautifully. Um, Stephen Noonan is on fire as the first Doctor. Uh, the the first story, the the, the Demon Song. You got a bit uh, of a bromance with Stephen Noonan. I've decided. Ha have you? <laughs> I think, yeah, I have. You've decided that, have you? I have. I mean, yes. <laughs> but he well, he's doing I, an amazing job, isn't I he? I really love the the era, and um, so. Anyone who puts as much attention to detail as Steve, even Peter Purvis, he put enough in there to, to make me uh, fall in love with his performance as the first Doctor too, even though it wasn't as close uh, as Stephen Noonan's. Well, very different, but yeah. The, it was very different. The, but the accuracy is astounding, and the detail yep. continues to amaze me every time I listen to him. What I love about the Demon Song is that it's taking Dodo and the Doctor, who and putting them in a contemporary setting, which is different to how a contemporary setting would have been in the 60s. So the contemporary setting is now. It's in the current times. So the Doctor's having to explain to Dodo, you know, certain technologies that we use now and uh, different things. So it's Dodo's future, but it's contemporary to the audience. So it's a really interesting um, way of telling the story. Uh, and I, I, I love it. Just love it. So that's what I'm listening to at the moment. I haven't finished the box set yet, uh, but hoping to do that over the next day or so. I started about five minutes in and thought I need to focus more on it. I was, I was doing I was doing housework at the time and thought, no, I need to sit down and listen to this. So I actually... How funny. I started away. listening to it when I was mowing the lawn and I stopped because I wasn't <laughs> focusing and I started again. Well, there you go. I haven't got back to it yet. That's the, a hot tip for the first Doctor Adventures. Don't listen to it while you're doing housework. Yes, you need indeed. to you need to focus more. You need to focus. <laughs> All right, thanks for your company on this very very interesting episode, Philip. I've I have enjoyed it immensely. I've had the best time. Like, I don't think I've laughed <laughs> so much for a very long time. All right, thank you so much, and uh, thank you for your company too, wherever you're watching 
us from or wherever you're listening to us from. We really appreciate your company too. We'll keep doing these as long as we can. We'll catch you all next time. This has been the Sirens of Audio episode 147. Run the podcast, talk the fun. With our guest John Levine and your hosts Philip Edney and Dwayne Bunny. Original theme music composed by Joe Kramer. Our website is sirensofaudio.com. You can email us at sirensofaudio at gmail.com or contact us via any one of our socials. Thanks for listening, audiophiles. We'll hear you next time.